Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm actually going to probably just focus on medicine because when I talked to Julio before, I thought I would do a little bit of like some travel stuff and medicine. I said, well, what I do is medicine, so why not talk about what I know, you know the most? And uh, my background is that I was. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I guess sorry about that. I don't. I'm not used to the microphone thing, so I'll make you stand still. Um, my background is that I started doing some volunteer work for um, the Atlanta Botanical Garden, and this, the story I always tell is I was at a carnivorous plant meeting in Atlanta, and um, Ron Galliardo, who many of you probably know or have heard of, came up to me and said, do you know anything about dark frog? Do you know I was a veterinarian? I said, all I know is they die in six months. Well, that's what was in the books, you know, the TFH books back in the day. And uh, so he and I worked together to get started at the Botanical Garden, and that's from that point forward I learned, you know, a lot of amphibian medicine. And certainly I can tell you that there are no absolutes in amphibian medicine. We have we know tremendously more than what we used to know, but still there's a lot to learn. And I'm not going to be able to tell you everything there is to know how to keep your frogs from dying. You know, that's we still don't have all of that information, but we can talk about some preventive medicine things. And uh, I'll try to touch on that. I'm going to go pretty quickly to get through everything because we want. To, I think we want to get to Devin's talk, which is going to be really fantastic. And uh, everybody who hasn't really had a lot from here in Madagascar, you're really enjoy. I threw this um, Oregon spotted frog up here just to remind everybody that the only frogs in the world are not dark frogs or not frogs within the tropics. Um, that a lot of conservation work where we learn, we have learned a lot of medicine, actually comes from temperate conservation projects. So this is one that's uh, uh, out in the uh, Pacific Northwest and uh, a captive breeding program with reintroduction of tadpoles. So they actually breed the frogs, get the tadpoles, put the tadpoles back out in the wild and let them metamorphose. It saves a lot of money, you don't have to feed baby frogs, so it, it really makes a lot of sense. So we'll talk um, a little bit first about just concepts of um, uh, captive amphibian medicine. And I'm going to touch on some of these principles over and over and over in the talk. Again, the thing to remember is they're not absolutes, there's not black and whites, there's not a cookbook that says, if this, then do this. Um, so some of the basic principles just of medicine in general is that books and drugs and lab tests and things you can do and spend money on, they don't really do anything to heal disease. The body heals itself. What those things do is they help you to facilitate the healing. So really when we talk about an animal that's injured or sick, we help them get better. And when it comes to amphibians, being healthy or not healthy is all about husbandry. That's really what it comes down to. It's not about the bottle of natrol or the bottle of ivermectin or whatever spray you put in or anything fancy that you're going to do with your tank. It's really about your husbandry. And as uh, I don't know how many of you up to hear Andres Garling's uh, talk today, a lot of it's about understanding natural history. If you want to successfully keep animals in captivity, the best thing you can do is go see that amphibian in the wild. And if you do that, you're going to understand what to do and what not to do and how to keep the animal. It's not about repeating someone else's mistake. It's knowing what that animal needs in its natural history and then transferring that into the glass box. So just a few principles I want to talk about. Uh, the terms that we use in medicine a lot, you hear infection, disease, and health. And so this is how I define those things. When something is infected or the process of having an infection, it does not mean that you're diseased. For instance, we could technically say that my skin is infected with bacteria. There are bacteria living on my skin, but there's no disease. My skin is healthy, it's fine, it's normal. So when we see and we talk about disease organisms that can be present in an in a ecosystem or in a tank, it doesn't necessarily mean the animal is diseased, therefore it doesn't mean you have to treat it. So for instance, if we were to test an animal, we'll talk about this late in the talk, if we were to test an animal, a uh, frog, and we found some type of intestinal parasite, we don't need to spray it with ivermectin because that's not what you have to do every time. Many of these parasites are commensal, meaning that they live in the body naturally and they're part of the, the animal's natural balance. So infection does not always mean that there is a need to treat. Disease, however, means that there is abnormal physiology, abnormal anatomy, or abnormal behavior caused by something, not always a diseased organism, but sometimes the environment. And then by default, optimal health just means the absence of disease. So this is how simplistic I look at infection and disease. But I think the key is, is to remember that infection is not something that has to have treatment every single time. I think you'll, you'll do a lot better with your animals if you understand that just because you find something doesn't mean you have to treat it. Uh, and then again, just some basic principles. 
when an animal is diseased, many things can go wrong. Uh, for instance, we can see reproductive ability go down due to a variety of reasons, uh, decreased egg production, infertile eggs or sperm. Uh, and then again, thinking about disease, disease is not always an infection. Like I mentioned a minute ago, sometimes it can be a nutritional issue, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And then of course, the biggest thing is, if you're unhealthy in general, you're probably at risk for other diseases that you could catch, like bacteria that normally don't cause an animal to become sick. They can become susceptible due to immunosuppression and then die from a, a typical bacteria that might be found in a water system. So again, uh, just to reiterate what I mentioned a minute ago, understanding the natural history of your patient or the animal that you're keeping is probably the greatest dif diagnostic tool to differentiate between normal health and disease. Know what that animal does in its natural habitat. Understand what, uh, define what is normal. How should it look and how should it behave? If an animal is not behaving optimally in its, in its terrarium, then probably it's under some sort of stress and that can lead to disease. And then a new concept we have to think about once we put that animal in the glass box is that we have to understand what is normal in captivity because there, an animal can be perfectly healthy in captivity yet it's not in its complete natural habitat. So we can't necessarily make that Oophaga lamini habitat perfect every time, but we can get close and we can see some of the normal behaviors and understand what that frog is supposed to do in the wild, see it do it in captivity, and know what the normal skin tone looks like, know what normal body condition looks like, and I think we can do a lot better by these animals to recognize disease processes before they actually happen. So, let's talk about some of the diseases, some of the things that you actually see in captivity. Um, and these are the types of, these are the things that I'll go over, uh, again, some of them in a little more detail because I think there's some that we're not as familiar with. I'm going to spend a good bit of time on these two here, so metabolic bone disease and hypovitaminosis A. Um, metabolic bone disease, we really don't see in dark frogs too much. It happens. It's out there. And, and definitely, I think some of you can say I've seen frogs that have shown signs of, of calcium deficiency or metabolic bone disease. But it is really not that common in dark frogs. And I, my theory is it appears that dark frogs do not require UV light to form vitamin D3. And we're going to go through that process in a minute. But they probably facultatively take in vitamin D3 through their diet. Humans can utilize D3 through their diet, or we can synthesize it in the skin. There are some animals that obligately, they have to have ultraviolet light on their skin or they cannot form D3. They cannot utilize dietary forms. And those are going to be a lot of our big insect-eating frogs, insect-eating reptiles, plant-eating reptiles. Those are primarily our animals that are affected. I'll briefly touch on, um, excuse me on that, uh, lipid keratopathy, how it can be uh, confused for a um, eye infection, and then maybe briefly I'll mention spindly leg syndrome. We don't know much about that, have some ideas, and then just some non-infectious diseases. And again, going to go pretty quickly. There's not anything in here about drug dosages or what you do if this happens. It's just concepts. We just want to be getting your mind in the right place and how to think about disease. And remember, this is the most important thing of my talk. If, if all of you want to walk out after this, the most important thing is that most of these diseases that we talk about in amphibians are all artifacts of the captive environment. Almost none of these things that I'm going to mention tonight happen in the wild that we're aware of. So I'm not talking about chitra. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally, I've heard enough about chitra. I don't need to hear any more about it. But in captivity, chitra is not that big of a deal. It's a big deal in a large breeding population for conservation purposes, mostly on the quarantine, on the intake side. But in a captive, well-managed collection, it is not that big of a deal. Um, Ranavirus, same thing. So we're not going to talk about those big infectious diseases that seem to pervade the news. We're going to talk about what goes wrong with husbandry issues in captivity. So let's start with uh, new metabolic bone disease, which again, if in simplest terms, we could term calcium deficiency. And uh, that's really, it's not the best descriptor, but how many of us have heard it. And the most appropriate terminology would be this, what we call nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism, or you're hearing more of today, nutritional metabolic bone disease. And what that means is we either have a scenario where there is too little calcium in the diet, or the animal is not able to utilize the calcium it takes in, partially due to vitamin D3 deficiency. So this is most commonly a problem in young growing animals. So when we're thinking about nutritional metabolic bone disease, 
It is not going to happen in your seven-year-old teen Taurus that you've had for you know five years in captivity. Just it just doesn't happen. There are other reasons that metabolic bone disease can occur in those animals, but it does not happen when the animal is already mature. But when they're young and growing from metamorphosis to about six months old or up to a year of age, that's where this disease can pop up. And again, dark frogs, it's rare. But in other frogs like tree frogs and um, gastrotheca that I showed a photo of a minute ago, very common. And we'll talk about why that happens. I'll actually show you some examples of gastrotheca. So again, most common in young growing animals, we see malformed bones, curved spines, or in some cases, none of the bone abnormalities, but simply some behavioral abnormalities or seizures. So if you have a young frog that is showing seizures, especially when it's stimulated, we commonly think about low calcium levels in the bloodstream. And again, the, the old, all the old literature talks about this being primarily an issue with the calcium phosphorus dietary ratio, and that is true, but what we're finding in most recently, last five to seven years, is probably it's an issue with inadequate ultraviolet B radiation for the animals, so they're not converting vitamin D, the precursors of vitamin D into D3, which is a cofactor of absorption into the bloodstream. And what I would recommend, again, it's, we don't need to go through the details of vitamin D3 and how it works, but if you want to know about it, the easiest way to go, to go look for it, is go online and look up Wikipedia, look up vitamin D3, or look up calcium metabolism. It is very simply presented, there's little charts and graphs, that it shows you how it works in a human, and as far as we understand, it's the same way in most vertebrates. So that's the best way to learn about this, and again, if you do, if you do learn all the details here, it's easier to understand where things can go wrong. So it's important to know, but for purposes of what we're going to talk about tonight, it's a little bit too much detail. Um, some other potential causes, I mentioned there are other causes of metabolic bone disease other than nutrition issues. Elevated fluoride in the water, rarely an issue today because we all know how to do our water correctly. Temperature, particularly in reptiles and uh, bearded dragons, there's documentation that bearded dragons kept too cold. Their, their body physiologically cannot absorb calcium even when vitamin D3 is present. So there could be some temperature issues in amphibians that have not been studied. And then the most important one is in older animals, chronic renal disease or kidney fail, kidney disease or kidney failure can interfere with vitamin D, which therefore can interfere with calcium. And again, uh, these are all of the aspects of vitamin D3. We really don't need to go through uh, this in detail, so I'm going to skip through this quickly. But if you ever have questions about it, feel free to write me or call or uh, mention, uh, have a question after the uh, presentation today. Um, I've mentioned this already that uh, some some of the uh, oops, some of the amphibian species are actually not that too far. Some of the reptile species that are most predisposed to this are, are um, insect eating and um, a, uh, plant eating reptiles. There is some, based on some observations I've had, I have a feeling that Hemifractus and Ceratophorus, so basically the Hemifractidae family, very likely can utilize vitamin D3 dietarily because they are frog specialists. This group, uh, primarily these two genera, are frog eating specialists. So it would make sense if you go and eat the animal that's already made the vitamin D3 or already has the vitamin D3 in its body, you should be able to absorb it. And we see that in lizards where if we have plant eating and insect eating lizards, they seem to require the vitamin D3 from UVB light. But the carnivores, the ones that eat other vertebrates, are all appear to be able to facultatively absorb vitamin D3, and that would be your monitors. And so your carnivorous lizards, they don't seem to require sunlight or UVB light to avoid uh, metabolic bone disease. So there's a possibility if we were to look at analogous species of frogs that probably the same thing is happening, but this has not been studied yet. And most importantly, when we're talking about frogs, all amphibians, there's no generalization we can make about anything. When we're talking about medicine especially, we cannot assume that what happens for dendrobates or phylobates or ophaga, that it doesn't go across the board. If a, a medicine is safe for one, it's not safe for all. So there's not a general approach to amphibian medicine or amphibian surgery saying that we can treat every single genera the same way. We have to be careful with some medications and how these are uh, metabolized. I'm going to skip forward a little bit and just go f now to the um, some photos I have. And here's the, uh, this is straight off of Wikipedia, it shows you how D3 works. 
but and uh, talking about UVB meters, there are ways you can measure your light output. So for those of you who do have frogs that require it, a uh, UVB meter like this, which just measures UVB in microwatts per centimeter squared, or you can get a meter that does UV index, and they're, both of those work equally well as far as measuring uh, adequate output. Uh, just one little thing about lights, and, and many of you probably already know this, Historically, when we were first discovering that there was a UVB issue with some of these larger tree frogs, we started using these ICO lights. But what's interesting is that these ICO lights had a little glass lens on them, and glass, glass and plastic absorb all UVB. So even though this particular bulb would make UVB, if you didn't take the glass off, nothing went into the tank. Similarly, if you shine UVB through plastic or glass, it all gets absorbed. There, there are a few uh, UVB pass through plastics, but they're expensive and generally not available to on the commercial level. Also know your lighting. So when we're talking about uh, good UVB producers, historically this is all we had. Now we've moved up a little bit, but a little thing to know, everybody's uh, LED is real popular now, well, LED so far, we're not getting any UVB out of it unless you get a $200 or $300 diode to make UVB. So generally it's not available in LED yet, I think in time it will be. Um, and then these are probably our best UVB or balanced lighting producers, the mercury vapor lights, but they do produce a good bit of heat, so they're not necessarily the best thing in the world for amphibians, but for some they may be good. And then the last thing I wanted to point out is uh, something we did at, at um, Atlanta Botanical Garden. When we discovered some calcium deficiency issues in some conservation animals, uh, we had these compact fluorescent bulbs that were used for growing plants. They're great to grow plants, and since at ABG we do a lot of plants in the tanks, they decided to outfit the, the entire frog pod with these lights. Well, nobody t desired, uh, nobody decided to measure UVB output, and these produced zero UVB. So this particular light here uh, is good at growing plants, but no UVB, and so we actually still have problems with certain frogs in the uh, frog pod. All right. So last little point I want to make before we get to the photos is that when we're talking about metabolic bone disease and how you see it, it is a very gradual onset disease inside the animal. So it is happening slowly over time. Basically, your body is, your bloodstream is too low in calcium. The body signals the bone to let calcium out to keep the blood at a certain level. And so slowly you're depleting bone, depleting bone, depleting bone. But what you see on the outside when the animal actually gets sick is actually very quickly, but the disease has been happening over a long period of time. And then when we go in reverse and we start treating it to make the signs go away, it takes a very long time, usually months. So to actually reverse the signs of the disease, it takes you many months and many animals will not survive. So once you see signs, it is usually difficult to get those animals back to normal health. All right, sorry, I'm still working out the, the right directions here. So uh, can everybody hear me without the microphone? Just a second, all right. So. This is a normal Gastrotheca cornuta male out of the wild. Uh, this was a frog that was collected in the wild and probably several months out of, uh, out of the wild in captivity. We would consider this normal. Again, going back to understanding what normal is. First of all, you need to know what normal looks like so you can recognize abnormal. So what I want you to pay attention to is the straightness of the body, the symmetry of the body, particularly the straightness of the femur, the straightness of the tibiotarsus, so these bones here, we would consider that normal. This is abnormal. This is a approximately six-month-old captive-born gastrotheca cornuta. These particular frogs were in Panama. And a couple things that you should notice are the relative shortness of the bone, even though this is still a juvenile frog, proportionally the length of the femur should be the same as that wild frog we just saw, but also notice the curvature. And then also, it's very obvious here, I'll show you a close-up of this uh, image in a minute, we have major spinal deformities on these rocks, both what we call scoliosis and kyphosis, so lateral curvature and dorsal to ventral curvature of the spine. So I always ask every group that I talk about this, what causes these bones to bend? And I understand that the, the bone is soft and so it's easy to move, but what actually is making the bone bend? Yes? The tendons and the muscles. Correct, the tendons and muscles. There are forces that are still acting on this bone normally. And so we have, we have muscles on either side of all these long bones, and one is a little stronger than the other, so the tension on that muscle continues to cause the bone to bend. And so that's where the deformities come from. And so if any of you who have ever um, filleted a fish or taken muscle off a fish, you notice how the muscle on the fish is all these lines, basically chevrons of muscles, 
Well, those chevrons and muscles pull a different power against that spine, and it bends and contorts and twists that spine. So if we look up, up close, this is what we see with those little frogs, and these frogs were still eating, believe it or not. They could still eat, and they could barely move around, but they were alive, and they, they can hop around and do fairly well. It's just that they were deformed. And yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll I'll finish the discussion on this before I move on to the next slide. When we're talking about a conservation effort with these particular animals, I mentioned to you that the disease comes on very slowly inside the body, and we see these changes happen rapidly. What happens with this type of bone is I can actually harden this bone back up. I can get these animals under UV light, and I can give them all the calcium in the world, and I can make their bones hard, but will they ever go back to normal? No. So that's the problem you run into. Are these animals functional in a conservation effort? The answer would be no. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the value of this animal for the purpose that it was bred in captivity in the first place? And so sometimes you have to make tough choices, even when you have a very valuable animal such as this, as these animals basically provide zero value to the conservation effort. And so do you continue to pour resources into keeping these animals alive and we know that they can't function for the purpose that we created? And I know that's different from our hobby frogs, but same thing if you have frogs in the hobby, it would be very difficult to continue to maintain these animals. Humane euthanasia would be recommended even though we can keep them alive. So being alive is not necessarily enough. Um, and then I wanted to show you very briefly, um, just a little experiment we did at the Atlanta Botanical Garden on some uh, evergreen toads. This was uh, Ancilius coniferus. We basically started with between 70 and 100 uh, frogs that were about two months old, and we exposed them to different levels of UV light. Either they had UV light or they didn't, and then either calcium or no calcium. And we did do uh, the rep cow with vitamin D3 as an oral D3, but we weren't using that as a control because there really isn't a D3 only uh, product on the market that is made for amphibians. So we basically used what was available on the market. And I just want to show you the results that we had. Of the, these are the groups. So we had uh, group one that had UVB light with oral calcium, group two that had UVB light with no oral calcium. Three and three, four, and five, no UVB light, and then we have oral calcium with D3, oral calcium with no D3, and no oral calcium. The bottom line of what we found was is that the UVB light in these groups didn't seem to matter too much for this particular species. What mattered was the oral calcium, and I'm going to show you some X-rays here of the different groups, and you can see fairly obviously the three groups that had calcium. <coughs> are here, here, and here. This was the group that had UVB light and, no, and, and uh, no calcium. This was the group that had no UVB light and calcium. So at least with this species, and remember, we can't say across the board for every single genus and every single species everything fits, but for this particular toad, if we did not give dietary calcium between about two months and eight months of age, these, fro these frogs all died in, at, at six months of age, and these died at eight months of, of age. We could not keep them alive. Even though at the time period we started seeing seizures in both of these animals, we offered them calcium UVB light. They were non-salvageable at that point. But this just goes to show, at least for this group, the most important thing we found was if you don't give supplemental oral calcium on an all-cricket diet, this animal will not survive going through uh, post-metamorphic time up to adulthood. So again, it's not a complete study. It doesn't show every option. It doesn't talk about oral D3. But what we did find is that oral calcium seems to be very valuable. So that might be something to keep in mind for your animals as you're raising them. Now again, if you gut load your crickets, you might be able to gut load with adequate calcium and be fine. But uh, certainly in this case, we found that the supplementation of uh, calcium powder with RepCal was very important. So. Um, I'm going to move on now, and we're going to talk about hypovitaminosis A. This is something I'm very interested in. It, it could be a little bit boring, boring, but I think you're going to be thinking about your collections and understanding where low vitamin A levels may have led to some problems that you've historically seen. Um, low vitamin A in amphibians was discovered in Wyoming toads, again, a, a North American or a temperate um, breeding program. And the, the presentation when it was first noticed, when the animals were noticed abnormal, was what was called short tongue syndrome. So you had this group of young toads, they were being fed crickets, and the toads would strike at the crickets, but they couldn't pick them up. So everybody that saw that said, oh, it's like their tongues are too short, something happened with the spatch. So the term short tongue syndrome was derived. But what in fact was happening is there were changes to the epithelium of the tongue that the mucus that the toads produced to make the tongue sticky was no longer sticky. 
And, and this was all caused, it was found out, this was all caused by vitamin A. Once uh, some, uh, some of the veterinarians and pathologists started looking at the histology, they realized that it was a vitamin A deficiency. And there are probably many other changes in the body that could be uh, caused by this. So I'm going to move through this one pretty quickly because I want to talk about some more conceptual aspects of this disease um, later on. But uh, the, the areas that we can see the uh, cause can be improper diets or gut loading for our food items. So here we can see that it's the food of the food items that's maybe more important than the actual food we give to our uh, amphibians. Possibly some species may require higher levels of vitamin A than others. And then there are times when we could see interference by other nutrients. This is more seen in mammals, not something I think has been documented in reptiles or amphibians to this point. So I'm going to go forward just a little bit here and uh, talk with, just show you some of the, the lead, one of the lesions. And one thing I'm going to caution, I almost didn't put the slide in here. Um, it, again, I, I go through a lot of the, uh, the social media sites and I see a lot of reports about what's wrong with my frog and, and things like that. And very commonly, a lot of us try to say, I see this on this picture, therefore my frog has this. And that doesn't work. And I can tell you, other than, other than a limb amputation or a missing eye, you can't say that the frog has a limb amputation or missing eye based on seeing a picture. So when we're talking about diseases like chytrid and rhinovirus and septicemia, a photo does not make a diagnosis. Um, and I, I'm only saying that because I see this happen a lot and you see strings of about 400 people commenting on how the animal has chytrid and you get rid of your whole collection because somebody saw a lesion on the leg of the frog. And these diseases don't work that way. Um, and certainly, if this is the tongue, this is the open mouth of a frog here with the tongue, or toad, with the uh, tongue right here, back of the oral cavity here. This is a lesion, a gross lesion of what the uh, hypovitaminosis A looks like. And I'm going to show you some histology.